So yeah, I guess uh, let's let's kick off and say, well, intelligence technology today is a big part of um, everybody's daily life, from anywhere between a Google search to um, you know uh, doing a stock trade, as we just learned from uh, Tim Tim Jostling. So, what do you think the biggest impacts of intelligent technology is today? So, intelligent technology, um, meaning uh, AI, loosely speaking. Well, yeah, I'm not really meaning like a uh, expert systems. I'm talking about like the sort of AI, which is yeah, a more machine learning, um, perhaps like a neural network style. Yeah, mm. I'll let you take the question where you want it. Really, I'm just um, introducing. All right. As a very informal response, something that I've noticed in uh, some of what I do here at RMIT is is how the big data thing is gaining momentum. And something that I feel is really interesting about this and um, is the way in which... is the way in which the use of data in this way is changing our approach to some forms of problem solving so that we are looking for relationships in systems without necessarily further pursuing the causal background behind those relationships or or an intuitive understanding. Mm -hmm. So rather than going from a theory or a hypothesis in a formalised way, uh, we, we are kind of accelerating into this territory now where we are simply probing for correlations and using those even if we can't really be more specific about uh, what they entail. But if they have some sort of useful pragmatic purpose, we work with them. Mm-hmm. And so it's really a, a kind of a, a bottom-up way of approaching our understanding of both the natural and the social world, uh, which of course is quite different to the traditional notion of AI, which is really about probing for a deep understanding of structure and then working back to specifics from there. So uh, to me, this is, this is something that's very current and is interesting, not just because it's being used a lot, but because it's, it's a different paradigm. I wonder, uh, Marcus, if you have anything to, to say about that. Um. I agree to a certain extent that sort of, I mean, the big data is def- definitely pop- popular a- at the moment and a lot of data helps and makes problems easier. But I don't think that the fundamental problems, you know, creating general intelligence go away or actually become significantly easier. I mean, you can do much more um, immediate useful AI, you know, like speech recognition is just, you know, hidden Markov model and then, you know, crunching billions of words through it mm. and, um, and, and and other successful systems at the moment. But for general, I, um, I think you, you still need sort of the core reasoning process mm. and um, I- even if you have sort of an infinite amount of data, yeah, um, that, that uh, um, yeah, just, just simply doing linear regression, on it, linear regression on it, Work. No, in in your view, then is 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 big data and that methodology. You know, I don't want to dwell on this subject because it's it's just a small thing. Uh, is it simply a a milestone in the road or a, a ladder that we'll use to do useful work that we'll later dispose of once our once the sorts of things that you're working on, AXE and other related more algorithmic approaches. Uh, become more powerful than they are at the moment? Or are the two more complementary? Yeah, I wouldn't say that it's a transient phase. I mean, a lot of data helps, and if we have them, why should we sort of not exploit that? Uh, I would think it's more orthogonal that, that, for instance, as I mentioned in my talk, I mean, you have, say, uh, assume you have a robot equipped with, you know, high-resolution camera, right? I mean, you can, you know, uh, after, you know, a couple of years, you have an enormous amount of data, mm. and um, you want to pre-process that somehow yeah. and, 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 and compress. But mm-hmm. And you can do certain simple things, I mean, simple mm. in quotation marks, mm. yeah, with current algorithms. Yeah. But then you want to do something really, you know, profound, you know, detect, mm. you know, string theory in it mm-hmm. or, you know, mm. or, or something. Yeah. and. There we still need, I think, something IXE-like. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So when you say orthogonal, I appreciate how that certainly is and that, that large amounts of data contribute to uh, making AI uh, algorithms work well. And I guess there I draw the distinction between lots of data and big data as a kind of, as a, um, as a philosophical What's approach. The difference between so what, lot of what, data and big data? So big data as a practical methodology of working with information where, and this, uh, this is a question that maybe is a naive question about AICSI, where we get results um, that we can use but that we don't necessarily understand. And so, for example, one way of, uh, w one way of asking a question about that in relation to AICSI is when you see AICSI solve a problem, are you able then to look back into the structure of that solution and understand it at a conceptual level or are you really just letting the system do what it does? Um, well, if you look into IXE or, or the approximations, it's, it, it's a big mess. Yeah? It, I mean, it's like the neural network approach, you know, they do magic things and, and we try to understand it. Um, it's, it's very difficult, but what you try to do is to understand certain aspects of it, right? I mean, you don't under try to understand, I mean, it would be great if you could, but um, so, you know, some, some sub-patterns or the, the average size of, of a solution and I mean, this is actually what is understanding about that you don't, you know, you know, um, really be model or or visualize, you know, every tiny asp irrelevant aspect. But so what is the essence? And um, you can do that to a certain extent. So in these approximations, where you use a CTW compressor which has suffix trees, and you can then display the trees, and these trees represent the knowledge, and you can look at them at least at these simple toy examples which we are using, and interpret them. Um, meaningfully. I mean, the real tree is so usually huge, but then you can sort of prune a little mm. bit further because the rest is sort of doesn't harm the system. Um, and and if you take this prune tree, um, you can interpret that. Um, but the the more complicated the problem is, the harder it is to get get the insight. And the insight you usually have is like with you know with say playing chess. We have the minimax algorithm to the end or to a certain depth, and then some heuristics. Yes, we understand in a certain sense what is going on. It's min, mm. max, min, max, mm. min, max, and then there's heuristic counting sort of the number of mm. pieces and so on. And that is a certain degree of understanding. And then, you know, Deep Blue makes a move and we are surprised, right? Mm. Because we can't do all the calculation. Mm. And, well, actually, we don't really need to do that. Mm. We still, I would say, understand how chess works mm. to a sufficient degree to be, say, happy about it. And, um, how far we can get with IXI, I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, it, it could easily be that the closer we get to AGI, the less we understand it. Mm. At some point, magically, it works, and we have no sort sure. of idea of what is going on. I, is there scope at this stage to use IXI for, say, uh, algorithmic discovery or to do science in a sense? So we we get IXI to understand something, and then if we want a formalized understanding of uh, of a solution to a problem that IXI seems to be able to solve. Is there a way we'll be able to look into what it's done to, to formalize or abstract back out of it? Um, yes, they, they are. I mean, the current approximations, you would use them for the scientific discovery because it's way too primitive, but the more complicated ones, if you're still then able to understand the in internal structure, right? I mean, sort of, I mean, do you understand string theory if I tell you what it is, you know? <laughs> and the same will happen if I try, you know, to look into IXI. Yeah. Um, possibly. Um, I mean, but there are other ways. I mean, you can sort of teach IXE, um, you know, to communicate with you and bring it down then to your level, mm. which is, a, I mean, a longer term sort of vision. Sure, that makes sense. So I, I kind of hijacked Adam's initial question. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't give you a chance, <laughs> Marcus, to actually respond to it yourself. No, I don't really have to. I actually understood it differently. You wanted a list of technology, which I think No, is no, not no, really. No, no. Um, let's, let's move on from that one. Um, so. You believe that uh, a, a form of reason can emerge from uh, a, 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 from inference. Okay, yeah. so um, reason being, reasoning is arguably one of the most uh, powerful human traits that we have. But um, do you believe that AIXI will um, have an emergent reasoning system rather than like having it built in? 
So it's definitely not built in and it will nearly definitely, you know, arise. It depends sort of what problems you, you give IXE. Um, so, um, I mean, to get, uh, go back to chess because you know everybody knows it and it's a neat example and I mean that's also explained in more detail in my book so if you interface it with chess um, so at the moment it will do random moves and it will immediately lose the game and then um, it will occasionally maybe make a legal move which means oh I didn't get negative reward so it realizes making a legal move you know delays losing the game and so then I've figured out the, the legal moves, but of course it will still lose. But then it will realize after playing enough games, um, well, okay, look, I mean, if I have relative to my opponent more pieces weighted, it takes longer to lose, yeah? So it will see a positive correlation between number of pieces, yeah, and time to lose. So it, and I mean, I'm anthropomorphizing, you know, all this. I mean, this will all go inside in theory in the Kolmogorov compression and in practice in the, in the compressors going on trying to sift through the data and, and represent them compactly. So then IXE, um has this positive correlation and, and tries to defend pieces, right, and has probably some weighting. And at this point, if you play against some players, you know, even good players, you know, maybe, you know, accidentally, you know, if you just keep the balance, you, you can win a game. And, or maybe not even win a game, yeah? So I assume you, you know, can draw against Kasparov or, um, and or now now it's uh, the, the Norwegian guy, right? Yeah. Um, so I mean, you know, drawing against um, one of the chess masters, you know, is a great achievement. And then you know, occasionally, either I mean, there's a symmetry in the game. Maybe it knows that you know, losing is the opposite of winning, and, and it exploits the symmetry, right? Or it accidentally wins a game. And you know, this story which I've told you involves a lot of. I mean, what we believe is reasoning, right? Okay, number of pieces counts, I should weight them, I should have a good position, and so on. And this is all going on implicitly in Kolmogorov complexity while compressing the data, and more explicitly when you have practical compressors, which are much more powerful, of course, than the current compressors we have. So yes, I mean, sort of look, if, if, you, if you want IXE to play chess, you know, it will um, start to reason. If we interface IXE just with, you know, um, keep battery level up and um, um, vacuum um, the floor, it will possibly not learn to reason but just be a reflex agent, right, doing simple operations. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a lot of science, well, most of science is done by induction, okay, not by, you know, reasoning. So um, do you think that AIXI is a prime, like a, do you think it could be developed in the near future to be able to um, perform scientific experiments on its own? Or, yeah, much like um, the Eureka uh, al al algorithm that was yeah, developed by Hod Lipson. It's very similar to yours, but yeah. have, you, have you heard of Hod, Hod Lipson's uh, Eureka algorithm? Uh, yeah, I think I have. Okay, so it sort of derived the laws of, like, Newtonian mechanics by watching a double pendulum. Uh, yeah, what was it in science or... Uh, the, the science or nature paper, right? Yeah, that wasn't yeah, very impressive. Yeah, so works. there was much earlier work which was much much better. If it did papers, I can't remember anymore. Um, mm. Well, there's definitely um, uh, automatic science sort of going on. Mm -hmm. um, say maybe one of the earliest work is evolutionary algorithms um, which optimize circuits, and um, I think Cosa was it got patents even out of that, right? And this is more recent work. Hmm. And I mean, biology, a lot of, well, I mean, a lot of, some of the research agendas are in partial, in parts de designed by computers. Hmm. And I mean, the question is how, in, you know, how intelligent was this part the computer did and what was the human part? But it's going in the direction, definitely. Uh, a, a colleague of yours, Jürgen Schmidhuber, said he wanted to design like an optimal scientist and then retire. Yeah. Are, you, are you as hopeful as he is? Yeah, yeah, I want to do the same, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, wh wh what would you say if you had a, a scientist to uh, figure out all the problems for you, would you then retire and sit in the Bahamas and <laughs> sit in Singapore slings or whatever? Well, I'm not a scientist, so <laughs> <laughs> from that point of view, it's uh, I, I might as well retire now. I well, guess what to about um, an automated philosopher. No, look, I would just ask, what is the meaning of life, and then wait seven and a half million years. <laughs> <laughs> it does come back to to what was mentioned in the previous session, though, which is um, this whole point about uh, the degree to which we need to do 
have a sense that we, we contribute something uh, meaningful mm. yep. through our mm. existence. And uh, I don't have anything more to say about that. But <laughs> there's a sense in which that problem seems to be raised by these kinds of conjectures. And maybe one potential solution is, you know, that uh, we, we are not separate from machines and we progress off on an adventure with them. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think we can also vicariously enjoy the discoveries and the progress of, of machines or of things that are not us as long as we can, we can understand uh, the significance of what they're achieving and maybe a little bit about it and, it, and it's paced in a way that we can comprehend. So, uh, you know, the hopeful interpretation of these things, whatever gets automated, is that either we can somehow be a part of it or at the very least we can uh, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, then let's move on to some ethical questions. Are you worried about AI being um, dangerous? Is that, a, is that a fear of yours? You can both answer that question. Start with that. <laughs> are you, are you uh, is unfriendly? Well, AI I mean, there's of course, you know, a large risk involved, yeah, but with many things, there's a risk involved, but there's also an opportunity, and that is not new. I mean, that mm. um, I mean, technology also, you know, self saved billions of you know, lives of people not starving anymore, and um, and uh, it can sort of lower at least the risk of other. Other, um, existential other things, you know, I mean, you can maybe, you know, with AI, you know, track, you know, the whole sky for asteroids um, and other things. Um, well, it, it's, I'm, I don't want to give my personal prediction sort of because I don't have one, you know, whether the net effect will be more likely to be positive or negative. I mean, in the, in the media and if you look at science fiction, it looks negative, right? But on the other hand, so far at least, most technology was ultimately used positively. And yes, AGI is different, but nuclear energy is also different, right? Yeah, you know, every new advance is you know, somewhat different. Yeah, well, and it's, it's amazing that we have you know, survived so far. <laughs> and um, I mean, the question is, shall we really sort of stop this development, even if we could, yeah, just because it's potentially dangerous? Yeah, um, and I mean, this was with, uh, with every new technology. I mean, if we had this attitude, you know, you know, hundreds of years ago, we would still live in cave caves, mm. right? Mm. There's that old story about the the AI that turns the universe into paper clips mm -hmm. because it's decided that this is um, a way to optimize utility, and obviously that's drafted to be an extreme and kind of ridiculous example to make a point, mm -hmm. but. At the same time, as a conjecture, it, it seems to me uh, unlikely that something intelligent enough to uh, have impact in and, and have the potential to, uh, to, to, well, let's just say something highly intelligent in one domain will be unable to abstract that intelligence into the understanding of a goal or a set of goals or a set of directives. Uh, now, there are obviously, there are levers. So uh, if, if a dumb system can launch a, a thermonuclear war, then, you know, that's, that's, a different si that's a different issue. But we're not talking about that in the case of the notion of a malevolent AI. We're talking about something which is either... Uh, indifferent to, to human demands or misunderstands them or is, is working uh, directly against them. But certainly it seems or that... Care. Or doesn't care. That's right. Um, so it seems to me that really, yeah, potentially this is a big problem, but it's the kind of question that probably needs to be treated iteratively in a, in a hard takeoff scenario for AI. Uh, it would seem that there's probably not a lot that can be done. Uh, in a slow takeoff scenario, we're there in it by in a position to kind of uh, gradually and, and step by step get an understanding of what the risk profile of systems like these are. Because from this distance, it's just such a speculative question that it seems hard to really start to address it to me. So to me, the solution is, uh, 
kind of hope for a soft takeoff, if, if, or however you want to phrase that. And we'll get to grips with understanding what the risks might be as we go along. But right now, the notion of risk related to, to AI is fairly nebulous and difficult to talk about. Yeah, sure, yeah. I, I agree that it is very difficult to talk about. I don't think that that... It's easy to talk about. It's, it's hard to get it right, right? Yeah, or it's hard to get it right. So I, I, I think that... It, I, I do agree, but I don't think that decreases the importance of uh, talking about it. Um, well, there are some who say that by default, AI will have cross-purposes to our own, um, and uh, cross-purpose goals to our own, and therefore um, may not really value our values and... You know, wh when we're dealing with um, like an ultra intelligent machine and their goals aren't our goals, it's not a very, it wouldn't be a very nice position to be in, most likely. But that's just my opinion. Um, it seems that certainly this comes back to the notion that for things to go really bad, the, the first mover advantage has to go to someone with a highly malevolent intent. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we can assume, as, as Marcus has alluded, you know, with new technologies we get benefits, we get risks, and we often use other technologies to offset the risks, and uh, presumably one kind of AI can uh, mitigate some of the risk of another AI. Uh, and in the first instance, it would seem that for an AI to have a bad goal set relative to human interests, that needs to have been intentionally put there by someone because Why? Val because values in themselves, well, let's suppose maybe an AI could have evolved with some sort of evolutionary algorithm perhaps that, uh, in it, that would impact its goal set. But largely speaking, goals and values are not a consequence of intelligence. There's no reason to value, as far as we can philosophically determine, to value existence over non-existence from a purely intellectual point of view. Intelligence is a means of achieving a goal, but it is never enough in itself to rationalise the goal. So goals are kind of arbitrary. They're kind of a... They're not irrational, but they're kind of irrational. They just are at some deep level. Uh, so, for example, we have goals, but that seems to just be an emergent property of the evolutionary process that we, for example, want to conserve our existence and survival. Uh, and, you know, I certainly feel that way, but it's not clear that I can really rationally defend the notion that I'd rather be alive than dead. So for an AI to have negative intentions, it has to have had a seed of some sort of goal or preference system. And that seed has to have started from somewhere. Now, it could have arisen randomly, but, uh, and I, I don't want to dismiss that as a possibility, mm. but on the other hand, it would seem that in most cases, uh, systems that deliberately go out to solve general problems across all domains uh, either, either are going to be following some kind of human lead. And certainly with IXI, we're setting up what the reward function is for the system to get in motion in the first instance. So. It would certainly seem that uh, when you're talking about the overall risk profile of artificial intelligence, if you are going to speculate that you're going to have these, this, an AI or a set of AIs that are being extremely negative and there are no other systems around to counter or mitigate that in any way, then you're going to speculate that either we've been very unlucky or someone with a malevolent, malevolent intent has got a significant first mover advantage in the process. Now, either of those two things are possible, but whether they're likely seems to be another question. That's my analysis. I'm, I'm more than happy uh, sure, to sure hear. Yeah. Um, well, um, it's not necessarily the case to me that uh, it, do it doesn't appear to be the case that you need to program in malevolent uh, goals in order for an AI to be malevolent from our perspective. <laughs> so, like, um, Steve Omohundro and uh, Nick Boston wrote a very similar paper, but Basic AI Drives. It describes how um, I, uh, so instrumental goals can sort of fall out of the original goals that are designed in, sometimes very unintentionally. And some simple ones could be, uh, okay, well, in order to play chess better, um, I better upgrade myself, I better protect, 
uh, acquire resources in order to um, run more uh, code through in order to be more optimal, I better protect those resources and I better protect my power source. Um, and also another way to win at chess is to think outside the board um, and you know try and wipe out my competition in, in another way. I mean, this is, it sounds like a silly example, but there are um, instrumental goals which fall out of uh, goals which we may program directly into an AI. Um, so, and, and the other thing is, goals may emerge. Um, I mean, our goals didn't come from nowhere. You said that, uh, they, they, they're a product of our evolution. Mm. Yeah, so. But anyway, um, do you have a comment, Marcus, on instrumental goals falling out of uh, programmed goals or intended goals? Uh, starting with the last thing that you said, goals can evolve. Uh, the fundamental goals cannot evolve, right? I mean, if you s if you design a system, it just does what it is designed to do. Um, I don't mean that sort of you know it hasn't doesn't have any intelligence, but it means that if I design a system with a particular goal, it will try to achieve this goal. And you can even prove that uh, a goal-driven system is not motivated to change its own goal. I mean, it's it's not that hard to prove, yeah, um, but. Um, there can be secondary goals, right? I mean, the biological goal of animals and humans actually sort of is sort of to survive and spread. And but then, I mean, in humans, it, it's, it's heavily masked, yeah. But but still, sort of, it it, it shines through, yeah. Um, and the question is actually whether this masking is something rational or something irrational, right? Yeah? Um, and um, the other point. Um, so how could we sort of alleviate the problem? I mean, first with IXC, I mean, we know with Asimov's law of robotics, you know, you try to sort of instill them and then all kinds of things can go wrong. Yeah. Um, so with IXC, that's not the case. Um, so there's a reward mechanism and you reward and you raise it, right? Yeah. I mean, th this is much more safer because, you know, as long as it hasn't reached uh, the level of human levels, yeah, I mean, you, you really push it in one direction and then you can hope yeah, that um, at least for a while um, it, it, it still keeps these values. I mean, the fundamental value is, of course, to maximize reward. And, you know, there are all kinds of things, you know, you kill all humans which give negative reward and, um, um, or, or, or just, you know, um, hijack the reward system. All kinds of things can, of course, go wrong, but probably it's still safer than having a system which um, has some, some goal sort of yeah. built in a priori. And the other scenario is Kurzweil's scenario that we merge with the machines and have meant ourselves that sort of a, a transition which we then probably, uh, most of us, are more happy. Mm. Yeah. And, and another, just one other point, which is not a defeater to any of this, but it's worth observing is that, it, certainly in our case, what we're seeing is that a side effect of intelligence is that we actually question our own goals. And, uh, you know, we, we don't all have the maximum number of children that we, it's biologically possible for us to have, which means that even though our intelligence is a byproduct of evolution, in some senses, uh, it's arguably work counter to evolution. And we might expect that in, uh, you know, artificial intelligence actually moderates its own uh, pursuit of goals. I don't know if you have a comment about That's that, Marcus. So, so rewired its own goal system? Uh, has a, ration, a capacity to rationally reflect on the value of the goals that it has. Have you got a comment on that, Marcus? Um, well... I'm not sure whether I comment. I mean, we have less children for various reasons. I mean, first we are scared of overpopulation, right? So we, so we just we are not only maximizing our own sort of um, reward, but also thinking about um, our fellow humans, right? Um, that is genetically built in this social aspect, mm. and um, then also, I mean, there's a trade-off. I mean, you know, children cause a lot of you know trouble and work, right? And um, I mean, in the past we sort of the options were more limited, right? Yeah, and now sort of we have more control over it. I, I, and maybe a dr more dramatic example, which doesn't necessarily point to rationality as such, but is certainly a side effect of our ability to be reflective. And it's complex uh, because depression will come into it, but is suicide. And this is a situation where we, we choose to die because for whatever reason, at that point in time, it seems like that is the best way to act. And that certainly doesn't seem to uh, 
at an individual selection level, it's not very evolutionarily compatible. You may be able to spin a very long story about how uh, there's some sort of group selection or species adaptation value in suicide, though I'm, I'm uncertain of that. I mean, but first, suicide mm. is extremely rare, and second, nobody says that it's rational, right? Yeah, I mean, in a certain sense, it is rational where, where if your sort of average um, happiness is negative, you know, it's, mm. it's the rational thing to do. Mm. But, um, you know, it, you could write it off as an irrational act if you want to, right? Mm. I, I'm not, not necessarily saying that it is, no. yeah, but uh, it's, it's a rare enough phenomenon mm. that um, it doesn't contradict really. So I guess the point before was um, there's a fair amount of concern um, in, in in the in the, I guess the some of the AI community about having AIs that can rewrite their own goal systems because um, if we start making an AI with our goals with goals that are compatible with our own um, and then it can also rewrite its own goal system it's it's hard to guarantee that we may end up with an AI um, that maintains a goal system which is compatible with our own. Yeah, I don't believe in this this type of ideas. Yeah, yeah. it's. I mean, What's it's always sort of you go to a meta step, right? I mean, you have reasoning, and then you think, okay, let's reason about reasoning, and you have meta reasoning, and you have goals, and you know, you change your goals. But I mean, there's always an underlying fixed system. And if you think, well, okay, I have this software, right, and, and allow functions. allow it to completely rewrite the code, yeah, but still there's an underlying sort of um, you know hardware, you know, which is fixed, mm -hmm. and um, that's what I said before, and the system is does what is it designed to do, and it has some initial goal, and I mean, if it is a, a, a goal-driven system, mm. right? Mm. And this initial goal um, will will not really be changed. Yeah. M so maybe the view mm. is not particularly useful. You should look at the more expressed goal, what we really see, and this sort of changes over time. Yeah. yeah. But you can understand that by looking at the underlying fixed goal, which will not change. So Marcus, do you think that's purely a property of uh, formalized uh, AI systems like IC? Uh, in, in previous talks, in previous conferences, uh, we've sort of had this theme coming through where uh, it's seen that maybe, and I believe James Newton Thomas has kind of made this argument that we get something very close to what looks like strong AI just by iterating on uh, on narrow AI systems, on big uh, bunches of heuristics uh, and, and simple tricks, and that just that will incrementally creep up to systems that are very, very capable, um, and uh, but don't necessarily have these kind of the properties that maybe. Or what I would like to ask is, do you think that that would be true about the? the lack of change or the lack of variability in the behaviour of a system if it's kind of cobbled together in this more chaotic way? Um, probably then it's not true anymore, but then the problem is that it's from the very beginning not or hard to characterise as a goal-driven system and take the digital Gaia hypothesis, you know, you have you know, all this computer connected mm. and then at mm. some point sort of it, it maintains itself. It does something and, you know, behaves or react maybe intelligently. Um, it's 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 not a priori clear what the goal no. is, right? And no. and then, then to say the goal is fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And so in this sense, we we, mm. we know even less, you know, yeah. what will happen. happen. And then it will appear, possibly, that this system has goals which you know may then change over time. Yeah. So kind of talking speculatively, then is it perhaps the case that the real or a key threat that we should be looking at and maybe more than a threat of sort of a strong high level AI is kind of the effect of a very of a chaotically kind of a very good narrow AI. Is that perhaps potentially more risky than a truly general system? As I said, I was speaking speculatively. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're on my face. Hmm. I don't see how, but I have to think okay. about it. Sure. Okay. Um, well, another scenario that Steve Mahundo, who who did come to Australia and and uh, talk about, uh, I think he, he he talked about many things. But one of the things he brought up was a, a nanny AI, sort of a narrow sort of like a AI to keep all the other AIs in check. 
um, in a sense that, you know, the, the a system of AIs, um, especially with like one large one at the top, it might have been Ben Hurt. Or, um, anyway, so yeah, so the idea that we have like a, a police nanny AI making sure that all, all other emergent AIs are doing the right thing, or other attempts to build AIs. Um, uh, yeah. Not malevolent and I don't exactly. grow in a malevolent. Exactly. So this is where the good guys, in a sense, have the first mover advantage, really. And uh, that seems to be totally plausible to me. And that would reinforce this kind of intuitive argument, and it is only that, that for a really bad outcome with AI, you need a, a number of things to go wrong in succession. You know, you need to either be very unlucky or you, and, or you need kind of a hard, a very unpredictable hard takeoff or you need kind of, uh, or in fact, and not or, a, uh, a malevolent first mover. Yeah, you'd be just being unlucky, but it may not be that unlikely, right? Yeah, so, I mean. Yeah, that's a key <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't dismiss the risk. Mm -hmm. I don't dismiss the risk. Sure, sure. Okay, well, um. Uh, okay, so let's move on then to, uh, do you think an ethical AI would have to have consciousness? <laughs> That's for philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a s I was going to say something about philosophers there. Um, <laughs> what a sorry bunch. Um, <coughs> the problem again is that the is about around the question of, of consciousness here. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, if we're just talking about you know a system that's functionally isomorphic with. Uh, say ourselves, um, there's, there's nothing special about ethics that consciousness bears upon. Uh, you know, we, we heard talk earlier about Steven Pinker and about um, Peter Singer. And a key thing that both of them speak about is really that um, our ethical success, if we do have any in, in the contemporary uh, epoch, is not just a product of say, some enhanced empathy or uh, developing sense of awareness, but it owes a lot, well, firstly, to better institutions, but uh, to our, our reasoning process. And, and indeed, Peter Singer puts a lot of faith in the, the value of the cultural conversation that we've built up over time about ethics and rights uh, as, as having had a big impact. Uh, Stephen Pinker's emphasis is maybe slightly different, but he certainly sees that as being significant. Uh, so, from that point of view, you know, just the capacity for rational reflection is very significant in terms of being ethical. And it's not necessarily clear, for example, that uh, something such as empathy, which doesn't ne necessarily seem to have anything to do with consciousness in a kind of uh, hard problem of consciousness sense anyway, but even if it did, it's not necessarily clear that empathy is, is a solution. In fact, uh, as is often pointed out, uh, Empathy is good in many situations, but uh, it has a dark side too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I also think that consciousness, uh, I mean, in the philosophical sense, is not necessary. I mean, self-awareness probably, or actually more important if the system is very different, it needs to be aware you know, of other humans, mm. how they reason and feel. So mm. they need to be sort of aware, but in a, in a technical sense, not in a philosophical qualia sense. That's uh, right. That's right. And if it, if it buys sort of as a, as a pre-existing kind of um, assumption that human well-being is, is important, it, uh, it probably doesn't really even need to be that sophisticated as long as it's happy with, with certain sort of key indicators of, of human well-being of the kind that, say, the, the UN or the WHO would report upon. Uh, if we're talking about you know, interpersonal dealings, then maybe you need to have a, a reasonably good model of mind to understand how to treat people nicely. Mm -hmm. But in terms of having a bird's eye view of what human well-being involves, we can formalise that pretty well in a pretty technical way without really even necessarily having a theory of mind, I would imagine. Do you yeah, think so we so ever acquire the need for raw feels? I mean, would an AI ever acquire the need for raw feels in order to, like, empathise or sort of be ethical? Uh, before I answer that, were you, you going to yeah, put something in, Marcus? Uh, okay, so uh, so so th this sounds like sort of an, an, an uh, a robot government sort of right. You know, I mean, to to govern yeah. us, right? Mm. You, you 
I mean, you need to get some key indicators right. And I mean, humanity would sort of need to learn to accept to be governed, you know, um, not by humans, but by a machine. I mean, there's this nice movie from 1960, Colossus, mm -hmm. I if you know that, which I think is a much more realistic sort of um, movie than the Terminator. So I mean, they're more, <laughs> they're more exciting, yeah, but I, um, so I mean, this computer was a war computer, but then they take over, um, and but it, but it's quite benign, but uh, just you know it doesn't allow um, everything, um, um, so it limits sort of the freedom of the humans, but in a in a benign and positive way, and um, you know maybe that's not that bad, right? You know, I mean, if you're a child, you know, you're governed by your parents, and it's not mm. for many children not the worst life, right? Mm. Um, so they know usually often better, and uh, yeah, it's limiting and it's annoying, but. Um, it has its positive sides too. Yeah, absolutely. And and we already, you know, uh, I think in, in large part this is the way we already work in that we, except for those people who are immediately around us, we treat people in the abstract and, uh, and we need to do that. It's very important that we do that because our... Um, our emotional systems don't scale well, as we know. You know, it's uh, we don't feel a thousand times more bereaved when a thousand people die than when one person dies, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that it's uh, necessarily always unimportant that we understand uh, the human psychology of, of pleasure and pain, but uh, we we can't depend on those things in and of themselves. About the raw fields. Yeah, about the raw fields. <laughs> okay, this. <laughs> There is very little support anywhere for what you might call an interactionist, interactionist form of dualism. So with, this, with the whole discussion about consciousness and, you know, it's, it, it's too broad a discussion to, to have in the form of an answer to one question, but <laughs> obviously, but there are certain kinds of responses to that question that do come up from time to time that uh, I think can be kind of... Um, can be dismissed. And one of these is the notion that, um, that there's some in-between point between uh, a kind of materialist functionalism and, and a dualism where we have something that's non-physical that plays a causal role in the function of the system. Now, it, it's not like that that hasn't been proposed and there are attempts to sneak in... Uh, sneak in a, a subtlety or a subtle distinction between the notion of, of physical and material. So uh, uh, there are those who would say that there are physical... Uh, properties that impact uh, function that are not material properties and uh, not everyone buys that. I think there's potentially a version of that that works and that's a completely different story for another day and it's, it's something that I previously yeah, presented upon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's essentially what I previously presented upon but it doesn't really actually bear on this question very much anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, there's any, any notion of that form that would play a role is, is really a variety of mysticism. It's really just saying that something causal happens here that's outside our conception of the physical universe. And, and you know, neuroscience is right 99.99% .99 of the time about how the brain works, but suddenly it gets it wrong. There's some kind of radical discontinuity in nature. And Look, there might be people who, who support that view in, in a number of ways, but it's a very difficult view to support uh, in, in, in any credible way. Uh, and uh, assuming one wants to sort of maintain to be a rationalist, you could take a Colin McGinn kind of position where he says, well, the physical answer to that cannot be the answer, but I have absolutely no idea what the answer is. So he's, he's not, he characterises himself as a Mysterianism rather, a Mysterian rather than a mystic. He, he says, look, I don't think it's any of that mystical stuff. I just think that 
we we just have no idea whatsoever what's going on here and I I refuse to say any more than that and that's his form position the, the book mysterious flame where he, he articulates that over the course of a whole volume so <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and and does it well you know uh, but uh, so the notion that uh, raw feels, whatever they are, and if, if they exist in some dualistic form, are going to have some sort of functional impact on something as specific as high level as ethical considerations uh, doesn't, isn't on the table in the debate, at least in... Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it is... In the contemporary, the table, okay. in the contemporary situation. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, um, then... Have you got anything to say about that, Marcus? Uh, no, that was on? too mysterious for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right. Um, so I won't ask the question about uh, uh, the Chinese room there. <laughs> okay, well, well, I mean, like, what can we do then if, if we believe that uh, a singularity is probable, at least if, there we, if there's a, a high enough percentage chance that a singularity is within the next, like, 20 years, let's just say, how do we work towards um, making it as beneficial or as nice as possible? What does it have to do with the Chinese room? Uh, what does uh, well, dualism? Oh, we're skipping the Chinese room, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's that I that yeah, was yeah, the I point. Said, we're skipping. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I'd like to politely skip over that section of the debate. Anyway, so um, what can we do? There, then? There's no debate about the Chinese room. That's all been figured oh. out. <laughs> just, just <laughs> <reason>. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, yeah, so w what can we then do to... Um, go to the Chinese room. Increase. <laughs> Let, let's leave. Yeah. We'll banish you to the Chinese <laughs> yeah, yeah. room to read dictionaries Let's take a closer look. for the rest Bye, of your we'll existence. go to the Chinese room. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. Well, yeah, what can we do then? Um, if we think that a singularity is possible and we think uh, that uh, it's worth working towards a, um, a better singularity than... Uh, we could achieve if we didn't work towards it, then what can we do? How do we most optimally act to achieve uh, uh, increased likelihoods of a beneficial singularity? I'll give a really kind of superficial answer to that, but I think it's the best one I can give, and it kind of comes back to something that I said before, but to kind of take a metaphor away from um, computer development even, we, we certainly, there's no waterfall solution to this. The only solution is, is an agile, iterative one. If, if we have a hard takeoff, then th there's no intervention anyway. Uh, so assuming that doesn't happen, and I, I think there's some reasonable, uh, there are some good grounds to think that the takeoff would be soft enough or that there won't be any takeoff, but there'll just be sort of a gradualist improvement. But uh, it, it's more about the principles from which we monitor the situation and correct as we go along uh, because there's such an unfolding tree of possibilities that we really can't see far enough down. So it's it's really a question of a, a, an applied solution that unfolds over time, well, not any long-term strategy. In in the short in the short term, well, like for instance, uh, Marcus teaches AI at university. Would you encourage people to look, um, to focus on certain style of AI more than others in order to, um, I guess progress the singularity in a better beneficial way well of course I pro you know I <laughs> propose my style of research yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but less so because I believe it is more benevolent or soft or whatever because I believe you know that is um, you know at least a good complement to all the other approaches and an important one if not you know the fastest way um, toward it, and as I mentioned with the reward system, there is sort of some safety there. I don't want to put that too high. Um, but another comment I had is that um, we should not make the mistake and um, forbidding ADI, AGI research, you know, like you know, stem cell research or whatever, you know, it will just go underground and then the risks get harder. I mean, it slows th things down if there's no government money anymore, right? Yeah, but it will come eventually, I, I think. There's enough sort of motivation to create it. My, my suspicion about that, and I'd be interested in your take on this, Marcus, is that um, AGI research won't, isn't likely to meet the kinds of roadblocks and pushback that something like stem cell would simply because, uh, and here's a guess, that to the layman, 
AGI kind of seems implausible and weird in science fiction, whereas stem cell, and particularly within the religious context, has a clear, immediate kind of emotional uh, reaction associated to it. So that we, we have one area of research which just seems abstract and disconnected, and another which kind of seems really personal and confronting. And uh, that could be an advantage for AGI in a way. Is that, do you think that's, there's something in that? Well, the religious aspect, I, I agree with you, there's a lot less religious aspect mm -hmm. sort of with, with AGI. But, uh, I, mean, if, I mean, if this singularity becomes even more popular, and here we have Kurzweil's book, you know, videos, conferences, and... The movie I coming mean, out next year, which is going to be pretty big with some yeah, Morgan and Freeman and, and Johnny Depp. And um, the young generation, I think, sort of the next one who grows up with all that, they are are becoming aware of that this is a, a, a possibility, yeah. and then I think uh, they could reject it equally strongly. Mm. But you're right in the sense that it's not fiddling around with humans, right? Mm. Which is always subtle. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's technology, and yeah, things can go bad, bad, but. Yeah, there's a, there's a sense in which we, it doesn't seem like you're interfering with nature. Yeah, but look at nuclear reactors. I mean, th this is also, tot uh, in my opinion, totally irrational you to, to, to reject that. I mean, in the long run, solar cells or whatever, you know, is fine, yeah, but, you know, switching them off frantically and you know, the safe ones because, you know, mm. you know, something won't... I mean, this is I'm simply totally irrational and, you know, that could easily, equally happen with, with AGI, right? It could. We, um, we need a catastrophe, yeah. a smaller catastrophe first. You know, some <laughs> some yeah. intelligent software used for, I don't know, the power network or something really breaking down and, and causing serious yeah. serious problems. It certainly seems like, it, you know, a film like Terminator 2, say, like Skynet, is very visceral for people. So th there's a sense in which it's easy to get that. Um, but in the case of nuclear radiation, it seems to me that there's... That th that's not so, even though you can't see radiation, uh, when people consider it, it doesn't seem so abstract. There, there's sort of a clear con connect between getting sick and being poisoned and these kind of folk notions of what poison is that goes well back. Um, but it's just less abstract because, I mean, we have nuclear actors now and we don't yep. have Terminator yet. So, I mean, if yep. we have, so assume we start with mm. household mm. robots, right? Mm. And then, you know, mm. millions of people have household robots and then some dysfunction and, and yeah. kill a couple of sort of, mm. uh, you know, just ten, you know. And then there will be an outcry and an irrational reaction, to, uh, possibly irrational reaction to that. I, I Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think once we have a very advanced system that people put a lot of trust into, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, and then something goes really wrong, then there will be enormous pushback. But, uh, and, and so I, I do agree, I guess the point would, would be, and we seem to agree on this, is that simply innately uh, there's kind of a, counter, a countervalent notion that people have that this, this is all kind of weird and spooky and will never work. Uh, and that right now exists despite a, a reasonable sort of pop cultural uh, interest in artificial intelligence, there is that strong cultural belief that uh, there's something extremely special about human intelligence and, and about biological intelligence and that this stuff is just weird and stupid and it's never going to get off the ground. So, y you know, that could work that for or it could work against. Mm. Yeah, and there's some interesting examples. Um, well, let's just say drones were made out of, like... Um, discarded birds, for instance, were purely biological. Do you reckon they'd be more scary than what they actually are now to, to the general populace? So we already know that. So th this, is, this is like James Newton Thomas's uh, notion of like, uh, you know, hybridising control systems with uh, insects. Oh, well, and yeah, I, I was uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's a point about it's kind of a battle star galactica there. I think... Um, what, what will happen clearly is that we're moving into an era with, say, the, the work that Craig Venter, uh, among others, is doing, where the distinction between the biological and the, the engineered is, is becoming blurred 
and that's likely to increase. So uh, I don't know whether people would, uh, you know, a priori fear kind of a, a microchipped bird more than a, a conventional drone. But probably what will become interesting is that we'll begin to see systems where, you know, maybe it's not so clear which bits are uh, mechanical in the classical sense or which bits kind of seem semi-biological or organic in, in some ways. And that might, that in-between phase, uh, you, if you think of it as sort of a technical analogue of the uncanny valley in, in CGI, mm -hmm. might be the thing that really uh, is unsettling for people. That's just a speculation. Sure, yeah. I mean, like, that's all we can do right now. But um, look, to a degree, like, uh, it's interesting. Uh, Hugo de Garris's views are quite provoking. And I I'm sure a few of you have actually seen his videos and such. And he came to speak at previous conferences. Um, he thinks that there's going to be quite a lot of backlash against uh, intelligent technology once, um, I guess, a, a threshold of the amount of people who realise um, that this may be imminent. Uh, do, do you think that that'll be a problem? Do you think, like, if, if, if we realise that, let's say we realise to a strong, a high degree of certainty that AI is, like, five or ten years around the corner, do you think that that'll have a big impact on, uh, on society? If so, how will they respond? Um, I guess it would have more impact if something goes wrong, right? I mean, normally people are quite, you know, accept a lot of things and mm. there needs to be some, you know, some minor catastrophe to, to wake them up. That's so it. As yeah. as so we, we need to be sure, you know, uh, ensure that nothing goes wrong and then we can go, you know, one step along, but if otherwise... That's it. It does take a lot to motivate people to sort of leave the house or, or even, you know, sign a petition online or whatever it happens to be. I mean, the default thing that people do is get on with their lives uh, unless they absolutely feel compelled to do otherwise. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think... Uh, I think Especially if there are benefits, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think there's scope for an awful lot of change to kind of uh, take place without too much pushback. Um, though it's always hard to trace where certain bodies of political discontent are really bubbling up from and uh, certainly uh, you, there are movements in politics that are probably related to people have a, having a generalised feeling that the world is changing and they're not being consulted and that could be as a result of all sorts of different things and, and technology is undoubtedly sometimes a part of that. Uh, but specific, uh, specific uh, resistance, I think, requires, in, in a world where there's as much noise as there is, requires something quite pointed to cut through all of that and, and motivate people to bother. There'll always be a fringe who kind of uh, want to embrace an issue, but for it to become mainstream is another thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess I'll conclude by asking you... What is it that, I mean, both of you are interested in, in the mind and how, how that works. What is it, what, what is fundamentally that interests you about intelligence? Why, why did you um, study consciousness? Why did you study, like, AI? What was the main drivers? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so for me, you know, when you grow up, there are lots of interesting things and... Um, you could do, and I was always interested in understanding the universe, so I mean, find your theory of everything and you know how everything works, and and AI. And the reason probably is because there's so many things you could do. I mean, you could try to cure cancer, or do other types of useful or good things, but I always felt yes, okay, that's another problem solved. Yes, it can be extremely important, or you know, settling on Mars or whatever. Um, another problem solved, interesting, but I mean, why should I work on this and not something else? And I always had difficulties with that. I mean, at the time I didn't work, but I mean, thinking about what I want to do in the future. And AI, especially in the sense that it's a meta problem, if you solve this, you know, the AI system can then solve all the other problems, right? And with the theory of everything, it's also similar, but less practical. And once you have the theory of everything, you know, for, for your universe, in principle, you sort of, you can answer all questions, although that is, you know, somewhat naive. Yeah? And so I switched back and forth between two the two fields, and um, so I finally settled on AI because, you know, I create this AI, and then I asked the AI to come up with a theory of everything. <laughs> so, 
um, I guess that's my motivation. But I mean, if I go even earlier back, uh, I remember that I didn't like to clean up my room. <laughs> and um, so I built nice robots, not of Lego, but something more sophisticated, me Mechano, I think it's in English. And so then I cannibalized my remote control car, and at the end, sort of, it could really you know, roll and have two grippers. And so, and it took me just 10 minutes to grip up one Lego piece and then put <laughs> it in, in the box. And so, somewhat I felt, you know, that's, that's something is missing. And I mean, I was, I think, a eight or so at that point. And uh, well, yeah, the brain is missing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe I'm here because I want a robot which cleans up my room. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's funny. <laughs> I was about to give a totally different answer. I'll still give it, but it, it reminded me of um, of looking through a, a library book when I was in primary school and seeing a picture of a robot and the fact that it had eyes and kind of thinking about how you'd engineer that and then thinking, well, how do you actually engineer it so it's actually you know it's actually seen? And so really this is sort of formulating the consciousness problem and um, I kind of assumed it had been solved. Uh, because there were drawings of robots, so that <laughs> <laughs> somehow someone had an idea of how you made sure that the ro there was genuinely someone home in the robot experiencing what was going on. Um, and I guess that was always in the back of my mind and grew from there. But as, as a more sort of general answer, I think as soon as you get old biographical, you kind of run up against the, what is it, the uh, introspection fallacy anyway, where you, you, you rationalise your reasons for doing things without necessarily having totally privileged access to your own your own emo motivations and you know I think when when you set out to do one thing or another you're kind of to some degree drawing compromises or balances between at least three things you know what what you're good at what you're interested in and what other people value um, and I know for me you know as, as far as academic work go I kind of started off in first year thinking I was going to do physics and then moving over to computer science and then eventually going much more into the philosophy of mind direction uh, and it uh, for me it's always just seemed to be a really interesting kind of uh, nexus between uh, technical uh, areas that have you know a capacity for a, a broad cultural impact and also tell us something about ourselves as well it's kind of a mirror to our own nature so maybe that's the reason maybe not <laughs> Fantastic, guys. I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, it was an awesome panel. Put your hands together for Andrew Dunn and Marcus Hutter. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so this is the end of the conference this year. <laughs> Another one. And I, I see many familiar faces coming back again. And I see some new ones, which has been uh, great to have you all along. And uh, congratulations to everybody who's hang hung around for the whole conference and made it through. Good on you. You've got a lot of energy. Off to the pub now. Actually, first we're going to go and eat, right? Um, so we're going to Gong Di Lin at... 264 Park Street. Third level. Level three. Level three, and it's on top of Noodle Kingdom. After which we're going to uh, the, uh, the rooftop bar, which is in the same building as um, coffee, uh, uh, cookies and, and the toff, but it's on the top of the building. And this is where someone has to rudely interrupt and uh, because there's nowhere for it on the, the, the schedule, very humbly for you to admit it, Adam. There, we need to thank Adam, I, I think. Um, this, th there have been many of these now and um, I, I think I speak for a lot of people when saying that we're very fortunate here in Australia and, and certainly and here in Melbourne even more so to uh, have your enthusiasm and unending energy to make these events happen uh, and uh, it's been another for me and I'm sure for everyone else uh, another really really enjoyable meeting. Yeah I can only agree <laughs> with I appreciate the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Well it's not just me uh, the Australian science communicators helped out with this conference and it was an awesome opportunity to I guess get the, some of these ideas churning out in, in, in new circles of conversation. Tony Smith has been hiding behind a pole there, uh, taking a lot of videos too for the whole conference, so he's been doing a great job. Um, the lighting here was done by John Ford. I don't know if he's in the, uh, the audience. Yeah, so he, he, he did that, um, so th thanks John. And Roger Hadgraft, who is the RMIT contact, who actually booked the room internally, making it a lot cheaper. And of course you, the audience, uh, for b ha having such great 
questions and, and participating. So thanks very much. It's been an awesome conference. Cheers.